Hello and welcome everyone. This is my uh, first YouTube video and I hope you'll find this interesting. Uh, today I'm going to be doing some work on a uh, Cume Track 142 drive. This, this is one of my spares I have for my computer. Um, it is a double sided, double density, five and a quarter inch floppy drive, and it was giving me a couple issues. And I was hoping uh, some of the issues I had with mine and what I went to investigate the problems might be able to help some other people out, or you might just find it interesting. Um, beside me here, I have um, this is my original PC Junior. This is the one I've had since I was a, a child. And uh, it's been modified a little bit over the years, uh, including some modern additions just this last year, uh, including even adding an AdLib sound card to it, which is kind of interesting. And right now it's running um, Pitfall 2 on a cartridge and is running through a RGB to HDMI to put it on the uh, TV. I do have the original monitor, which still works just fine, but uh, for ease of use, it's a lot of times easier just to hook it up to a monitor and also for video capture. Um, so if you're looking for a good video source, RGB to HDMI works great. A um, couple of words of caution, if you have not worked on these systems before at all, is one interesting thing that I did not learn until a couple of months ago is the inside of the case on the PC Junior is sprayed with a gray paint. Um, like me, you may have assumed that that's just a paint and may have even used the case as a uh, background mat for working on your equipment or something like that. Uh, be careful because the gray paint inside is actually conductive. So if you've got a live circuit laying on it, you may get shorts through the case, which is kind of interesting. So uh, it was obviously some form of RF shielding at the time. Uh, it was just a spray on shielding since the case is not metal. And secondly, uh, I do use an oscilloscope for part of the testing on this. If you are new to using an oscilloscope, uh, relatively new like me, remember to take some uh, um, cautions with it. The one, the main thing to remember is anything you connect to the ground lead on your um, scope is connected directly to earth ground. So you don't want to connect that to anything that is not either already directly connected to earth ground or if you've got a circuit that isn't plugged into anything, uh, you can then you're a little more free to put it um, just about anywhere you want. But uh, I would recommend looking up a couple of uh, other YouTube videos. Uh, EEV blog is a great place to look and learn about some of that kind of stuff. So, so with that, let's go ahead and get started and take a look at some of the problems I was having with the drive. All right, so here we are booting up the machine, uh, and this is the built-in tests on the PC Junior. You get to this by pressing Control Alt Insert. Uh, I'm not sure if any other IBM PCs have these built-in tests or not, but the uh, Junior certainly does, and it's a good way to get a first diagnostic as to what's going on. In this case, you uh, enter on this particular test, you enter MPNP and put in the disk, and it's going to format the disk, so make sure it's not one you care about. Um, I also did attempt this test with the uh, JJ diagnostic plug inserted in the back, and uh, I think I got a different error code, but it was still um, not a useful error code. So as you can see right here, we got back error code B. So unfortunately, that was not particularly helpful. So let's uh, go ahead to the bench and start taking a look at the drive. All right, so here we have the drive in question. Uh, as you can see, this is the front of the drive right here. So this is, of course, where you put the five and a quarter inch disc in. And the problem I was having with this is on the bench, when I would connect up power to it via the Molex connector on the back, or the, the 12 and five volt power, it would uh, turn slowly uh, was one of the problems. It's not a big deal, um, but uh, it was still kind of, I didn't really like the fact that it turned slowly when it had a little bit of power. But more importantly, um, when the motor would actually turn, uh, I found out that it kind of has an irregular um, drive speed, which I'll, uh, I'll show, uh, show that next. But the, uh, the motor speed was not consistent and it was audibly different. So uh, but right now I thought I'd just take a quick chance just to kind of point over some of the main parts of the drive. Um, the uh, main things, of course, you have, I mean, you've got your power connector on the back, your data connector over here. Um, and then, of course, your motor is right here, and the tachometer is actually part of this as well. And um, you've got your hub and your spindle and your drive rails, your head carriage right here. And... Um, your connector for the various sensors on the drive for detecting whether you are at the alignment hole or not and whether the disc is right protected things like that and this is actually connects to the read write uh, and erase coils so that tells the drive when to read write and erase and this is the connector for um, the motor and i forget what else this is connected to 
Um, and I'm going to talk about shortly, but some of the main components I'm going to talk about, the Q13 transistor is right here. Um, you've got the main transistor right here, Q14, that drives the motor itself. And the Q7 and Q8 transistors, which are used on the side select logic, which we will get into. Uh, the resistor network is right here. As you can see, it's unpopulated. And there's also the U4 chip, which we're going to get into, which has uh, got the AND gates in it for um, picking which side of the disk is currently active. The main part of the logic, the, the drive speed control, is kind of all over here. So all this, for the most part, is related to controlling the speed of the drive. Um, that's all just kind of focused right here. Like I said, this chip right here is the main, is the frequency to voltage converter right here that drives the uh, drive speed itself. One of the interesting things to note is this is actually an older drive and when I compared it to one of the newer drives that I have, which this is out of my system, um, you can see there are a couple of differences so don't be surprised if yours doesn't look exactly like this, but this drive is a little bit newer. You can see it's got a higher serial number. But um, one thing to note is they did obviously change this connector out. There's only, they're only using, um, there's, well, there's several of the wires here they're not using. It looks like they're only using maybe up to eight on here. And this is a um, 14 pin connector. So it looks like at some point they cut that down. The drawings don't necessarily reflect that. So just pay attention if you have to diagnose anything with this. The pin numbers may not match up. They're not exactly the same. They did change it slightly. Um, other things to note was um, this, the older drives have a resistor across um, pins 1 and 8 here on the U1 chip, uh, which I've drawn in the diagrams I'll show in a minute, uh, whereas this one actually has a separate resistor broken out on the circuit board, so they actually moved that off. Other than that, uh, the other things I did not point out is your drive speed adjustment resistor is right here, and here's the one. Do not touch that. Um, that is related to the uh, read circuit, and I have no idea how to calibrate that, but I would highly recommend you do not touch that one. All right, so here we have the uh, drive on the bench, and you can see I've got a test lead connected to uh, what amounts to the motor enable um, signal. It's just an easier location for me to grab the uh, motor enable signal and connecting it to test point ground. And if you can hear, the uh, drive speed does not sound good. It's a little hard to tell in the video too, but you can see the uh, the uh, alignment uh, rings on the spindle there are not moving smoothly either. And that's uh, so that's the motor enable off and then back on again. And that's uh, with no disc in the drive, that is completely unloaded. And here we'll go ahead and uh, take the belt off of the drive uh, just to, as a quick check to make sure it's plain motor with no load at all, not even the spindle, and you can hear it still does not sound like a regular speed. All right, so as you could see or hear, um, this drive obviously has something up with it. So um, going on the uh, Brutman PC Junior forums, and hopefully I've pronounced that correctly, apologies if I did not. Um, I uh, asked around and got some suggestions for the first thing that a lot of people attempt uh, on these things and seems to be a common issue is that they, they need some oiling. I mean, a lot of these drives have been sitting for a long time. So um, some of the suggestions for oiling basically amount to um, oiling the, uh, the hub and the spindle and um, even the motor a little bit. And of course, the drive rails. The drive rails is a pretty common one to hear about. What you want to do for the, we'll just start with the rails, is you want to get some type of uh, lint-free cloth. Uh, Q-tips can leave a little bit of lint, but you might be okay, but you need to kind of clean it off a little bit with um, with just a little bit of like denatured alcohol or something like that. And as far as oil goes, um, you can just use some type of uh, thin oil. This is the stuff I was using. Um, and you just want to put the very, very thin coat on these. You do not want to put too much oil on here. Um, but you just, there are two rails to oil for the head track here, and you can move this if you need to. Just be careful. You do not want to knock this out of alignment. Also for the um, hub right here, what you can do is there is a small C-clip right here. You can just use a screwdriver and very gently get that off of there. 
Uh, I'm not going to do it right now because it will possibly send that part flying and I don't feel like chasing it. But uh, once you get off that, you can take this and take this thing apart and get just a tiniest bit of oil, especially on this one. Uh, this is above the disc normally, so if this does drip or anything, it's going to go right on your disc and that's, that's just a bad day right there. Um, you do not want to do that, or possibly onto the heads and things like that. You, you do not want to do that, so use the oil very sparingly. The spindle down below, which is the kind of the lower part there, is a little bit harder. Uh, this would be actually be this part right here. There's uh, basically the joint underneath there. I actually had a really hard time getting anything under there. I tried a small needle. Um, problem is that I couldn't get a good enough angle at it anywhere to get it actually underneath. Um, I just was not able, and the needle head was actually too big to get underneath there. So I did actually get a um, a small catheter actually to uh, try to oil that with, uh, although that turned out not to be my problem, but if you have trouble getting, I would get just the tiniest bit of oil kind of on the center of that shaft there. Hey everyone, quick bonus tip for you here. Dr. Octal suggested to me a better way to oil this drive shaft pairing than the uh, method I was using, and this should be a lot easier for you folks. Uh, the basic suggestion here is uh, turn the drive upside down, take the belt off, and what we're going to do is put a couple of drops of this oil, uh, the same oil that I showed earlier in the video, uh, on the center there. Uh, I could probably have a little bit extra there, but and then you're just going to turn this by hand. Um, if you get a little bit too much extra on there like I did, uh, you can probably wipe a little bit of the excess off, or just make sure you don't turn it too fast that it goes and goes flying off of this. You don't want to power the drive with this because it'll just fling it everywhere. But uh, he just suggested that he's had really good success in getting drives unstuck using this method. Now the other mistake I'll make, I did make, uh, which I would not recommend, is this little sticker here. Um, I thought was part of the, uh, the drive motor and uh, it looks like there's a little spindle underneath there and I did put a little bit of oil under, right, right underneath this sticker. Don't do that. That is not where you want oil. That didn't cause me additional problems other than having to clean it up later. So that's not really going to help you. Um, you might be able to get like a little bit of oil kind of underneath this uh, collet, I guess, right here where the belt is connected to. But again, um, very small amounts. So you really want to try to get it to run into the motor, I guess, a little bit. So if somebody has any good tips for how to do that, that would be uh, helpful. In my case, the oiling did not really have any effect on the drive speed, uh, unfortunately. So uh, next step was actually to go to the service manual and start trying to determine how the circuit works and what, uh, basically to learn, learn how it works and what could possibly cause the issues I was seeing. So let's go to the service manual. All right, so what we have here is one of the two main circuit diagrams of the QM track. This is from the... Uh, manual from the drive and I've uh, cleaned it up a little bit from some of the pages that were really hard to read. This is the other main circuit diagram as you can see I, I did add one little piece on here which I found uh, as actually implemented on the board. There are other changes but I didn't investigate what the exact differences were. All right so first off um, this is the speed control circuit right here so this is the uh, motor enable signal or motor on signal. And uh, as you can see here, this is kind of the highlighted area which we're going to get into uh, detail as far as how the speed control circuit works. And uh, for instance, this resistor right here is a 1K resistor that is added across the basically a number one pin to ground or on the older drives it actually seems to go from the number one pin over the top of this chip and over to the eight and it's the same as far as the circuit's concerned. But obviously they redesigned the circuit at some point. Um, but no, I do not have, uh, I have not seen any di diagrams that seem to be up to date on this. There's likely some other differences too. Uh, for instance, the way this right here is drawn, this shows a resistor network in place. Um, and yet, if the PC Junior drive does not have this resistor network in place, and yet you still see 5 volts down here when this signal is not connected. So obviously, it's still getting voltage from somewhere, and even when this resistor network is not present. but not really important for the purposes of this discussion. All right, so this is uh, kind of cleaned up the uh, the motor control circuit part of the diagram, so it's a little more legible. Um, and over here, this is the motor. M is the motor. Uh, T is the tachometer for measuring the current speed of the motor, so that feeds back into the circuit. 
And uh, as I said before, the resistor network is not normally present and you don't need it to be. This You can still do this testing with this in place, or sorry, with the chip removed. Uh, my understanding was that that resistor network would normally be needed, but because the PC Junior has such short controller cables, um, it's not required, or at least that was my understanding of what I was told. This Q13 right here, this is the transistor that controls whether the drive is on or off. Uh, in this case, this transistor is just used as an on-off switch, and there are other capacitors here, uh, you know, C13, C14 ground resistors, and this is the main chip that controls the board. Uh, and it is a frequency to voltage converter chip. So basically it converts the tachometer voltage coming in on pin, uh, the, sorry, the frequency coming in on pin one and converts it into a voltage output on pin five. And I believe this C13, R53, and C14, this makes up a feedback loop. Um, this actually is, the three output is kind of what drives this voltage that's coming across from the 12 volt over here to come down to a voltage that gets used to drive the motor over here. Let's get into more specifics of how exactly the drive behaves, at least as far as we're concerned, as far as the uh, motor turning on and off uh, when the motor enable signal is turned, was grounded or left floating. So in this case, I've drawn this as if the um, motor signal is floating. So this is like if you're testing this on a bench and you just don't connect anything, this except power, this is what it's going to do. So. I draw 5 volts coming through here. I, it doesn't actually come through this as I said before, but you do get 5 volts on pin 11 of this chip coming from somewhere, and it uh, does feed into this uh, Q13 transistor. And in this case, uh, this does power the transistor, which causes it to basically sink um, to ground. Uh, what it does is it causes this 12 volts over here. Instead of being used to drive the chip, basically all the current flows out following the screen line and goes out to ground. So basically it, none of the current gets to go down here to enable, to turn on this, this set of transistors over here um, to actually turn on the motor. So this is the motor off state. Now, in the case of the motor being on, in this case, like if you're testing it on your bench and you ground this signal cable, uh, this is actually what happens. Um, the, basically you don't get the voltage needed here over on the base leg of the transistor to turn this transistor on. So it actually does not go to ground. So in which case the drive, this, the drive will actually act normally. Um, the, the, the voltage will be allowed to get into the chip and uh, the chip will control the voltage. I didn't highlight everything exactly, but this is just to kind of give you the gist of the, the voltage and current does come down and flow through the Q12 transistor pair and out to the motor, and that is actually what turns the motor on. So my initial thoughts when I was looking at this is if the motor speed was not stable in my case, uh, I was wondering if there couldn't be an issue with the C13, R53, C14 um, set, uh, or possibly the chip itself, or even the motor. Uh, it's always a possibility there is something up with the motor itself. Uh, what I actually did was carefully disconnected the motor cables from the connector on the back of the drive and uh, plugged it into a 9 volt battery just to drive the motor, uh, being careful to observe polarity. And uh, the motor did actually seem to work just fine and sounded fine, so it seemed to hold a nice constant speed. I didn't hear any fluctuations, so that kind of led me away from thinking that the motor itself was having a problem. Uh, but, you know, I often become suspicious of, you know, old uh, electrolytic capacitors. Um, so I was kind of curious to see 13 C14 could be a problem. Uh, if I recall correctly, the ones on the actual driver are not actually electrolytic, but still, it was still a thought I had. What I started to look at next was actually the uh, tachometer itself. So uh, I was curious what the output of that was doing. All right, and here we have the suspect drive, again with the motor enable connected to ground, so the motor will turn on and we're going to connect our probe up to the tachometer output, which is this pin right here. Now the drive is not powered right now, so it's not going to turn on until I plug it in right now. All right, so looking at the tachometer here, according to Sam's computer facts, this should be eight volt peak to peak. Uh, and what we're seeing here is very irregular to say the least, uh, which corresponds to the bad sounds we're hearing, and it's only 40 millivolt peak to peak. If we compare this to uh, one of my good drives, you can see on the right here, uh, this is uh, 8 volt peak to peak, so that 
does seem to be correct. And this one is, as you can see, much smoother as well. So there is something going on with this tachometer. So here I've highlighted just kind of the tachometer circuit. As you saw from the, the video I just showed, the tachometer output on this drive was not good. Uh, it was actually much lower voltage than it should have been. Uh, although you could see some frequency there, but it was kind of bouncing around a bit. And if you look at the tachometer signal on here, it's actually pretty straightforward. I mean, it's just connected to ground on one side and comes straight out and straight into pin one on this chip. So unless this chip is doing something to sync this current or, um, or somehow pull the voltage down on the tachometer signal, which it shouldn't be doing, uh, that's kind of strange because the, this is pretty straightforward. I mean, other than this resistor to ground, but that's just, that's, I think, just going to change the voltage a little bit. As you can see, uh, we had an issue of uh, the tachometer voltage just being really low, and I couldn't really see a good reason why. So my next uh, line of reasoning was to investigate um, the tachometer itself. I didn't actually know exactly how it worked, and I figured I would go ahead and pull it out uh, and try and get an idea of how it worked. Um, the tachometer is driven actually by these uh, these two wires right here. Uh, I have already removed the two screws from the case here just to make this uh, a little bit quicker, but what uh, what I did was just uh, carefully open this up by just pushing, kind of pushing the wires out of the way just gently. And then uh, lifting this top piece off and just kind of setting it aside for right now. Um, so really all the tachometer is is there are some, I guess, alternating poles and um, I'm going to assume that's a magnetic core, or at least an iron core, that creates a magnetic field and creates the voltage. Now, what I noticed was when I looked at this, at first I just thought, okay, well, you know, it's turning and there's, you know, it's really not much to it. So my first thought was, well, first of all, I had oiled inside here and gotten oil inside uh, the bits inside there. Um, and I thought that might be shorting the voltages or something. Um, but that wasn't it. Um, I cleaned up all the oil, which that is why I said uh, don't oil that. Uh, it's really not helping anything there. But um, but what I did notice is I opened up one of my good drives, and what I noticed is when I turned the the spindle here, the the iron bit here, but kind of by hand, uh, it turned a little easily. Um, whereas on the good drive, I could actually feel the different magnetic pole changes in the motor. Um, you know, as a I guess a stepper motor. So I thought that was a little bit odd. Um, you know, obviously you can take this thing off, but I also noticed there's like a little bit of glue on the one side. It might have been glued down at one point. Um, well, it's awfully loose, but what I did discover is if I flip the magnet around, it fits on much more snugly. And now when I turn it, it uh, I can actually, you probably can't hear it, but you can actually um, feel the motor and it seems to be tied to it, which is uh, much, much improved. Might be able to hear that a little bit. So, um, armed with that, and trying this again, we will hook this up and show you that after you flip that around, all of a sudden, the motor speed is much better behaved. Okay. So now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and connect this up as if the uh, motor enable signal is grounded and I will connect power to it. And we'll see that um, the motor speed is much better now. So now the motor is holding a nice steady speed and um, may or may not be able to see it here, but the, um, the uh, 60 hertz, uh, I'm in the US, so the 60 hertz um, pattern is holding nice and steady. I don't see it shifting forward or backwards. It's maybe clocking slightly counterclockwise, very, very slowly, but it's nice and smooth. I mean, the next step to take is if it's not, um, what you need to do is uh, just put in a little, you can adjust this resistor right here. This does adjust the drive speed and you'll need to look at it while you're doing it, of course, but um, that will change uh, how fast that turns. Now, if you don't know, let me remove this here, go ahead and disconnect the power. If you don't know, um, the rings on here are, there's a 60 hertz ring and a 50 hertz ring. Uh, if you're in the US and on 60 hertz power, the 60 hertz one is what you're gonna wanna look at. And you wanna be under uh, ideally fluorescent light or something like that, that it basically is, uh, has a resonant frequency of 60 hertz. So it will actually flash in a way that makes it uh, this pattern. You'll see the pattern kind of moving 
And if you want to play with it, um, if you haven't ever seen it before, um, you can adjust that resistor and watch how the pattern kind of starts drifting forward and backward as you adjust that resistor. And the, uh, of course, the other thing I ended up doing was um, to fix the other problem of the drive occasionally turning on when it uh, was plugged in but not connected the ground to the motor enable, as I did replace this Q13 transistor. It's a pretty, um, pretty common transistor and pretty easy to find, so I just went ahead and replaced that, and that seemed to fix that issue. So uh, next up is uh, hooking it back up to the computer again and seeing that it works. All right, so for here, we're just using the, uh, the old DOS format command. Uh, format this five and a quarter inch disc to its massive 360K capacity, uh, which shouldn't take too long. And uh, again, this is a double-sided, double-density disc, so we should get 360K. And speed that up a little bit, and that's not right, 180K. Here we are, and uh, back on the Cube Track manuals. And this is the, what I've highlighted here is the region that's related to the side select signal. So this is the signal I was investigating for the issue of uh, only being able to format the disk to half capacity. This seemed like a good place to start, uh, if nothing else, than to just understand how it works and maybe lead me in a direction for where the problem is. Because of the specific problem I was having, the fact that I could even format the disk to 180K, uh, it appears that side 1 is actually the side that's giving me trouble, uh, and side 0 is actually working. Um, that's just because the FAT table is stored on track 0, and the fact that I could format the disk and read it as a half capacity suggests that this is the side that's actually working. So here I've done the same thing again, uh, where I've cleaned up the circuit diagram to focus on the area of the signal uh, of this circuit that makes sense. Um, and kind of stripped it down to where I thought the problem could be. I mean, after this wire goes up towards the heads, I didn't quite understand what that part of the circuit was doing as well, so I focused on the earlier part of the circuit. Um, not to say there couldn't be issues down there, but I focused on the parts I could understand better first. Uh, and the SAMS Computer Facts, uh, which is another great resource uh, for the PC Junior, uh, does have a troubleshooting section on disk will not switch sides on page 12. Uh, I'm not going to go into what that says, but it's basically the same tests I'm doing here. It has on page 12, it has you focus on testing some of these um, transistors and other parts of the circuit. So similar to before, we have the Q7 and Q8 transistors, uh, which similar to the uh, speed control circuit, these are again just on off transistors. They're not doing any sort of fancy amplification or anything. Uh, they are just uh, just used as on-off switches in this case, which is great for me uh, because that makes more sense to me. And just as a note, this uh, PR signal is uh, always high or always has 5 volts when the drive is powered. This U8 symbol right here, this is actually an inverter, so basically if the signal coming in is high or 5 volts, the output's going to be low or 0 volts or near, near ground. Um, or opposite, if the input is low, the output's going to be high. Let's see, U4, this, these are actually two AND gates that are both on the same chip. The way these should work is if the only way pin 5 can be high on this output is if pin 6 and 7 are both high. If either one of these is low, this output should go to ground. Uh, same applies with, uh, similarly, to pins 1 and 2 and 3 here, so it's just a, a simple AND gate. And uh, this is actually, uh, if you're more curious about what exactly is happening inside here, um, this is what how the circuit uh, actually behaves internally. So in this case, this we've left the side select floating, in which case, uh, similar to before with the resistor network, which again is not actually connected here, but you do get 5 volts approximately over on this uh, pin 7, pin 3 input here. So this is these uh, signals right here are high. The 5 volt here is high as well, and what ends up happening is the output of U4 is high, which turns on the Q7 transistor, thus sending this to um, ground. And so this 12 volts basically does not feed to the head zero. Now on the other side, pins uh, one, pin 1 here is high, but pin 2 is, is low, because if this inverter is working correctly, uh, this will get a low signal, this signal will be, will be uh, the AND condition will not be true, and it will um, drive to ground, in which case this transistor Q8 is not powered, and 
the 12 volts feeds to the head one, um, going off to the head one read write coils and erase coils. So in my case, what I noticed was that with the side select signal left open, or high in this case, uh, I noticed that I was getting a 12 volts on the Q8 collector, which is what I would expect, and the Q7 collector was showing ground, which is uh, as it should be here. So, And for those of you who may not know, the leg here is the, called the base leg. The leg without the arrow is the collector. The leg with the arrow here is in the emitter. Um, but short, long story short, uh, in this particular condition, everything was working as it should be. Uh, the signal was behaving correctly. This was getting grounded, and I was seeing 12 volts here. Now, when I moved on to the other side, uh, I went ahead and grounded this input. That was just by connecting it to the ground test point on the drive. And the uh, what ends up happening is the circuit kind of gets reversed from the last diagram. With the side select signal low, um, and the, this 5 volt signal here coming in, I'm not sure what PR actually stands for, maybe power ready or something, I'm not entirely certain, but um, in this case U4's output goes high, and that turns on the Q8 transistor, and thus um, this uh, head 1 is connected to ground, and similarly or inversely, head 0 gets uh, the 12 volts is coming in here. So when I actually measured it, uh, I actually noticed I had zero volts on the Q8 collector, which is uh, correct. It's basically to ground, so that was correct. But when I came over to Q7, I also saw that this signal was grounded, which is just wrong. Um, the Q7, sh the collector leg, should not be grounded in that case. So that seemed to indicate that either something's wrong with the transistor or some other part of the circuit along this, this line. So, uh, continuing further, what I did is I actually looked at the U4 chip. Um, pin 7 showed low, 0 volts, uh, and pin 6 was high. That's as it should be, so, you know, that's just a sanity check to make sure the inputs are going in high. However, when I looked at the U4 uh, pin 5 output, uh, there was actually uh, 5 volts there, which there should not be. And one thing to note about these, uh, if you look carefully at this diagram for how the AND gate works, this U4, uh, or this 75451, or at least this one AND gate, uh, or all of them for that matter, they can't actually set the output high. Uh, they can only set the output low. If you look at this, there is no actual 5 volts feeding into this chip at all anywhere. So all it can do is either be floating or go to ground. So what happens is, and this is why this plus 5 volts is here, uh, through a resistor is if this output is not grounded this 5 volts will end up driving it and that's how it actually turns on. I'm sure there's a name for this and it escapes me right now. This signal can only go to ground if the chip grounds it. So in this case I was getting 5 volts up here telling me this chip was not going to ground. So uh, that made me believe that this U4, the 75451 set of AND gates uh, is is flawed. So I actually ended up uh, desoldering this chip and replacing it, and uh, that did actually fix my issue. Good news is, is you don't need a fancy oscilloscope to do any of these checks. Uh, you can do all of this with just a simple multimeter. Now that we've gotten th this uh, second issue fixed, let's go ahead and try to format that disk again. So again, we're looking for 360k here, hopefully. And we'll speed ahead here, and everything appears to be working just fine. There we go, 360K. More space than anyone would ever need, surely. But to success, that's great. All right, so I hope everyone found this video interesting and possibly learned something in the process, and uh, maybe even helped some other people who are having some issues with their floppy drives to keep these old uh, disk drives working. Uh, I have a bit of nostalgia for the old drives. That's what I grew up with, and uh, the boot-up sound of DOS 2.1 is firmly ingrained in my brain. So it's always kind of nice to see them, and uh, I rather do enjoy the sounds. One thing to note is I did go back and look over the circuit diagrams for the side 0, side 1 select, and what happens in the particular case I had. Uh, what ended up happening effectively is when the 
drive controller at select aster side zero, it would select side zero correctly and turn off side one. But when it selected side or when it attempted to request side one, it would actually enable both sides of the disk. And actually, if you go back and carefully look at the 180K disk format, you'll see that the DOS format command did go from head zero to head one on the first track one time. And then after that stayed on head zero. So obviously it did some form of checking to figure out that the disk was what it thought single-sided. I'd also like to uh, extend special thanks again to uh, Dr. Octal on the uh, PC Junior forums at rootman.com for uh, giving me some advice on how to uh, address issues with some of these drives often have and just uh, in general keeping me chugging along working on the problems and getting to a point to where I could get the drive to work. So uh, thanks again for that help. I do appreciate it and I'd also like to thank everybody for watching. Feel free to uh, like um, and we'll see if I have more time. I'll try to create more interesting videos in the future, but <laughs> at, a, at a pace I can manage. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and play some King's Quest. Thank you. 